how much of that inflammatory response do you think is mediated by permeability in the gut specifically yeah. versus, because I have to be honest with you, Mark, this is an area that I've never understood. It gets talked about a lot. There's lots of hand waving. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I see it, certainly in patients. I mean, when we see subtle elevations in fibrinogen and or C-reactive protein, or at least two of the interleukins, we usually put patients on elimination diets till we find out what the culprit was. And, and we're trying to basically titrate symptoms versus these biomarkers. But I find that to be staggeringly crude. And to your point, I don't know what we're missing. And I don't know what's true, true, and unrelated. And then, of course, it gets back to the question of what's the mechanism of this? And so one potential mechanism is that the permeability of the gut is altered. And if bacteria that could normally not translocate across the lining of the gut do so, that would certainly be a reason for inflammation. A, do you think that that's yeah. a prevalent oh, source yeah. of it? Oh, yeah, huge. I mean, all our guts are messed up. And there's a whole phenomenon called metabolic endotoxemia. It's been well described and studied. And the fact that your gut microbiome plays a huge role in regulation of weight independent of calories. So they literally can take the poop out of a skinny rat into a fat rat and make them skinny and vice versa. They've done it in humans. I think the way in which it works is that your microbiome is regulated by what you eat. The amount of fiber, prebiotics, the phytonutrients, the phytochemicals, the polyphenols all affect the quality of the garden you have growing inside of you. And you can get a lot of nasty weeds in there. When that starts to happen, they start to disrupt the gut microbiome. They disrupt the lining of the gut. They cause what we call leaky gut on top of everything else, which is our low fiber diet, high sugar processed food increases bad bugs in the gut, antibiotics, acid blockers, anti-inflammatory drugs, hormones, all screw up our gut. And of course, toxins, environmental toxins, glyphosate is super toxic to the microbiome. And so all these things that we know and those things we don't know are disrupting the microbiome. And when that happens, the lining of the gut becomes slightly damaged, the biofilms get disrupted, and you end up absorbing bacterial products, bacterial toxins, as well as food antigens, things that we should normally tolerate, that start to create an inflammatory response. And 60% of your immune system is in your gut. And you know, what's really striking to me, Peter, is you know, sort of the discovery that many of our metabolites in our blood, probably a third or more, may be from microbiome. In other words, when you check your blood tests, we're checking human analytes. But when you actually start to do some more sophisticated metabolic testing and metabolome, you find all these things that aren't human, that come from bacteria that are regulating your immune system, that are activating your, your mitochondria, that are regulating your DNA, that are affecting your brain chemistry, affecting your mood, affecting all sorts of diseases. So this is like a really exciting area. And I think getting people's microbiome sorted often happens when you shift to a whole foods, plant-rich diet, not plant-based, but plant-rich. How can one measure these things? I mean, one of the things that I've found difficult is finding valid commercial tests mm -hmm. that can enable patients or physicians to understand if they're in this sort of regulated state. I mean, to me, the black box is when someone comes in and says, I have gut dysbiosis or I have poor gut health, and they may be right, but it's very different than someone who says, I have type 2 diabetes, where we have really clear ways to diagnose it. We yeah. kind of have some understanding what the pathophysiology is here. This is much more squishy. And frankly, there's an enormous disconnect between people like you and sort of the stuffy, upper-lipped gastroenterologist who makes his or her living in the gut, but doesn't necessarily sort of see the problem this way, right? They're looking at different problems. You know, honestly, Peter, the evidence has become so overwhelming that mainstream medicine is bought into this whole microbiome story. And Cleveland Clinic, for example, they're studying the microbiome and heart disease and arthritis and cancer. And it's like, they just got a $12 million grant from the NIH to study the microbiome and heart disease, which is pretty amazing. And yet, and yet, if you go to your doctor and say, is there any evidence that I should be on this probiotic or yeah, this? Yeah, they don't know. The clinical translation is challenging. So I'm somebody who's been practicing functional medicine for 30 years, and the gut has been the number one focus of our ability to really move diseases in a powerful way. And they used to call me Dr. C every poop because I've done literally tens of thousands of stool tests and have looked at all the different ones. And you're looking at a moving target. You're looking at an ecosystem. And so... We look at a lot of different biomarkers to assess what's going on in the gut. Is there adequate pancreatic enzyme function? Looking at pancreatic elastase, are there 
absorption issues, looking at fecal fats. Are there inflammatory markers in there? For example, calprotectin or eosinophil protein X, which are standard markers to look at inflammation in the gut. What's your IgA levels, your antibody levels? And then we look at indicators of dysregulated gut microbiome, such as short-chain fatty acids, which are essentially produced by good bacteria that are the fuel for the gut and have anti-cancer properties, anti-inflammatory properties. And those can be low, like butyrate, and we can see that. Then we look at sort of different microbiome characteristics using DNA or PCR analysis through the microRNAs. And that allows us to see, for example, if there's low acromancia, which is a very important bacteria that regulates your biofilm, that regulates immunity, that's linked to autoimmune disease and cardiometabolic diseases, cancer treatment therapy risk. So we can modify those things. And then we, we look at culture, we look at other kinds of testing for parasites, it's PCR testing. So there's a lot of things that we look at and get a gestalt. It changes over time, but you can see if someone's got a good gut or an okay gut or a terrible gut. So if you take a patient who is both symptomatic and by some consolation of tests has a quote-unquote bad gut, what percentage of those are quote-unquote fixable by subtraction? So you take things out of their diet or addition, you add more of certain food to their diet or the third choice would be intervention-based where you have to use sort of supplements and antibiotics, yeah, right. antibiotics or probiotics or things like that. So that's an oversimplified look at this, but if there's three levers you have, which means take something out of their food, add something to their food or add a different type of food, or then use a, a bigger gun like a supplement, how do those tools fit into this treatment? Well, functional medicine is a very organized framework for addressing gut dysfunction called the 5R program. The first R is to remove, remove things that shouldn't be there whether it's foods that are triggering a problem like gluten, which affects permeability or dairy, grains for some people, remove bad bugs. So if you have a parasite, I mean, I just had a patient who had a common parasite. She had stomach issues for 20 years. She was always waking up feeling like crap. We gave her Alinea, which is an anti-parasitic medication. Six days, she said she's never felt better. So sometimes you just need to do that. And maybe bacterial overgrowth you have, maybe there's yeast overgrowth. You need to address that. And so that's the first step. The second step is to replace what might be missing. So fiber, prebiotics, enzymes, various things that may be needed to support the system. And sometimes that's just through food, but sometimes that's also supplements. Sure, you can take prebiotic fibers and prebiotic foods like plantain and artichokes and all kinds of different foods and then re-inoculate, which would be provide probiotics where necessary. And that can be through foods like fermented foods or can be through probiotic supplements. And those are, that's still sort of a wild west, but there are things that out there that really work. And then to replace what's missing. So maybe there's nutrients that the body needs to heal, things like glutamine, vitamin A, fish oil, maybe even things like butyrate and replace things that might be needed for healing the gut, like polyphenols, for example, are a wonderful thing you can get from food, pomegranate, cranberries, green tea, et cetera, that have powerful, great effects on the microbiome that we didn't really appreciate. So we thought it was prebiotics and probiotics, but it turns out the polyphenols in plant foods are super helpful for the gut microbiome. And then the last R is to restore, which means to sort of restore your nervous system because you need to sort of deal with the way in which your stress level and everything affects your gut and your gut microbiome. You can get a leaky gut just from stress, for example. So working on all those in a systematic way that's personalized is really the approach. There's no sort of, oh, take this or do that. It's 